Hello, welcome to our journey through the book of Leviticus. Today is Leviticus chapter 26. And we are definitely rounding third base, getting ready to end this book. And I have so enjoyed this. I'll be honest with you, this has caused me to look at Leviticus much deeper than I have in the past. And it is, I'm not going to call it my favorite book in the Bible. I'm still not entirely sure which one that is. I love the book of John a lot. And I also love the book of Ephesians a lot. But this might be one of my favorite in the Old Testament. There's just so many great principles here that transcend time. It's just good ways to do life with one another, to do life with God. And once again, the whole goal of the book of Leviticus is to keep a nation free, to remind them, this is how you stay close to me. These are the boundaries to know where your guardrails are so you can stay in freedom. And then also, this is how to stay close to the Lord, to experience His favor, to experience His goodness. And that's what we're going to see today is, is God is getting ready to finish up this book to keep that nation free. He's been talking about all the different you know, skin diseases and sexual things and whatever, whatever's. And this one is going to talk about setting up those guardrails. The first several verses are going to be about blessings for obedience, obeying the commands of the Lord. Then the next several verses are going to be about punishment. You know, just like there's blessing, there's also judgment if you don't do what God's called you to do. Then he's going to finish it up with restoration, you know, through confession and repentance. So it's the idea of, I want to bless you, but if you choose to go a different way, then all my promises are true, the good ones and the bad ones but there's always a way back. I hope you get that out of the book of Leviticus. If I could give just one synopsis of Leviticus, one of the things I would say is, is that God wants to give you healthy guardrails and always provide a way back. So first, let's start off with the good news. Verse 1 through 13 is going to be about blessings through obedience. So if you've got your Bibles, you want to pause this, get your Bible ready. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation. Verse 1 says this, Do not make idols or set up carved images or sacred pillars or sculptured stones in your land so you may worship them. I am the Lord your God. You must keep my Sabbath days of rest and show reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. And I love this. If you follow my decrees and careful to obey my commands, I will send you the seasonal rains. The land will then yield its crops and the trees of the field will produce their fruit. Your threshing seasons will overlap with grape harvests, and your grape harvest will overlap with the seasons of planting grain. You will eat your fill and live securely in your own land. I will give you peace in, in the land, and you will be able to sleep with no curse for fear, no cause for fear. I will rid the land of wild animals and keep your enemies out of your land. In fact, you will chase down your enemies and slaughter them with the swords, with your swords. Five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of, of you will chase 10,000. Your enemies will fall beneath your sword. I will look favorably upon you, making you fertile and multiplying your people, and I will fulfill my covenant with you. You will have such a surplus of crops that you will need to clear out the old grain to make room for the new harvest. I will live among you, and I will not despise you. I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you will be my people." I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, so you will no longer be their slaves. I broke the yoke of slavery from your back, so you can walk with your heads held high. Isn't that amazing? God's saying, these are the things I want to do. Please obey my instructions, obey my commands. You can live in my covenant. But then there is the other side as well. And here it is, verse 14. However, if you do not listen to me or obey these commands, and if you break my covenants by rejecting my decrees, treating my regulations with contempt, and refusing to obey my commands, I will punish you. I will bring sudden terrors upon you, wasting diseases and burning fevers that will cause your eyes to fall, fail and your life to ebb away. Lord, help us. <laughs> you will plant your crops in vain because your enemies will eat them. I will turn against you, and you will be defeated by your enemies." Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will run even when no one is chasing you. This is terrible. Verse 18, and if, in spite of all this, you still disobey me, I will punish you seven times over for your sins. I will break your proud spirit by making the skies as unyielding as iron and the earth as hard as bronze. All of your work will be for nothing. Your land will yield no crops, and your trees will bear no fruit. Even then, if even then you remain hostile toward me and refuse to obey me, I will inflict disaster on you seven times over for your sins. 
I will send wild animals that will rob you of your children and will destroy your livestock. Your numbers will dwindle and your roads will be deserted. And if you fail to learn the lesson and continue your hostility toward me, that I myself will be hostile toward you. I will personally strike you with calamity seven times over for your sins. I will send armies against you to carry out the curse of the covenant you have broken. When you run to your towns for safety, I will send you a plague to destroy you there, and you will be handed over to your enemies. I will destroy your food supply so that ten women will need only, will need only one oven to bake the bread for their families. They will ration your food by weight, though you will have food to eat, you will not be satisfied. If in spite of all of this, you still refuse to listen and remain hostile toward me, then I will give full vent to my hostility. I myself will punish you seven times over for your sins. Then you will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters. That's terrible. I will destroy your pagan shrines and knock down your places of worship. I will leave your lifeless corpses piled on top of your lifeless idols and I will despise you. Wow. I will make your cities desolate and destroy your places of pagan worship. I will take no pleasure in your offerings that you should be pleasing, that should be a pleasing aroma to me. Yes, I myself will devastate your land and your enemy uh, who come to occupy it will be appalled by what they see. I will scatter you among the nations and bring out my sword against you. Your land will become desolate. Your cities will lie in ruins. Then at last, the land will enjoy its neglected Sabbath years as it lies desolate while you are in exile in the land of your enemies. The land will finally rest and enjoy the Sabbaths it missed. It missed. As long as the land lies in ruin, I will enjoy the rest you never allowed it to take. It will allow the joy, the rest you never allowed it to take for every seventh year while you lived in it. And those who, who survive, as for those who survive, I will demoralize you in the land of your enemies. You will live in such fear that the sound of a leaf driven by the wind will send you flee. You will run as though fleeing from a sword and will fall even when no one pursues you. Though no one is chasing you, you will stumble over each other as though fleeing from a sword. You will have no power to stand up against your enemies. You will die among the foreign nations and be devoured in the land of your enemies. It is a sobering thing to read. I imagine a sobering thing to hear, but here's the better news. Here we go. Restoration, verse 39. Those who survive will waste away in your enemy's lands because of the sins and the sins of their ancestors. But at last, my people will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors for betraying me and being hostile toward me. When I have turned their hostility back on them and brought them to the land of their enemies, then at last their stubborn hearts will be humbled and they will pay for their sins. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. For the land must be abandoned to enjoy its years of Sabbath rest as it lies deserted. At last, the people will pay for their sins, for they have continually rejected my regulations and despised my decrees. But despite all this, listen to this, I will not utterly reject or despise them while they're in exile in the land of their enemies. I will not cancel my covenant with them by wiping them out, for I am the Lord their God. For their sake, for their sakes, I will remember my ancient covenant with their ancestors, whom I have brought out of the land of Egypt and the sight of all the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, regulations, and instructions that the Lord gave through Moses on Mount Sinai as evidence of the relationship between himself and the Israelites. You know, this chapter started with blessings. If you will do these things, I've got all these great blessings, all these great blessings. But then as I was reading that, I can almost just, just feel the, not desperation, but just like, please, please don't do these things. And you notice how the progression would get worse. First off, it was, hey, the crops aren't going to work out. Then these other things aren't going to work out. And then it's going to get worse. And then it's going to get worse. But you could tell at every given point, God gives another opportunity. Just come back to me. No, I don't want to come back to you. Okay, well, then it's going to get worse. And then it gets worse. Come back to me. I don't want to come back to you. <laughs> it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And even then you can hear how God is like, please. But then finally, I love at the end, even if the worst things happen, I'm still not going to reject you. You're still mine. I still want to provide a way back. It reminds me of just the other day. I was talking to one of my daughters 
and they wanted to go somewhere uh, for, for a weekend, go to, go to a thing. And we have this thing on Thursday nights called check-in night. And what that is, we have check-in, and it's, it's check-in to make sure your chores are done, check-in to make sure all your school assignments are done, check-in to make sure your room's clean. So it's check-in. And we do it on Thursday so that then all weekend they can, <laughs> quote-unquote, enjoy the blessings of the Father, right? They get permission to go do the different things, you know. But that's why check-in happens. And my, one of my daughters had this very special thing she wanted to do on Friday night. And I told her, I was like, I am so excited Make sure you get your stuff done so you can do it. And she looked at me like appalled. And she was like, you mean to tell me that you would take away my event on Friday night because I got check-in? I said, absolutely not. I would never take it away from you. So she looked at me confused. And I said, now you may choose not to go, but the choice is completely yours. I haven't changed anything about check-in. You know, it comes around every Thursday night. And I want you, please, I want you to go on Friday night. I want you to enjoy yourself. Please go enjoy yourself. Man, that would be so amazing. I said, but, but you would take it away from me. I said, I will not. I will not. You may take it away from yourself, and I may be forced to enforce the rule, but I'm not going to take anything from you because I want you to go. And I don't know about you, but that's exactly what I read when I read this. Like I, I can almost sense the, the, um, the devastation of God when he's saying, I want you to enjoy all these great things, but I will enforce the rules if you make me please don't make me. Please don't make me. And even then, if you make me, I'm still going to love you. I'm still not going to cancel my covenant with you. And I think that is a wonderful lesson for us today. God is just, which means all of God's promises are true, the good ones and the devastating ones. He doesn't want to do them. And as you saw, even if he has to enforce the bad ones, he still doesn't give you the worst thing. He gives you the first bad consequence, consistently trying to give us an opportunity to find our way back. And so, the important thing is to not say, why would a bad God do this? I think the other thing was, why would God do anything good? Because he loves us so much and he gives us the choice to stay in his favor. So I think it's a good idea for all of us to purposely stay in his favor. What an amazing journey we've been on. We've got one more chapter to go. I will see you tomorrow as we finish up Leviticus with Leviticus 27. <music>